Will you join me in reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8? If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Fifty-six men signed the Declaration of Independence. Their conviction resulted in untold sufferings for themselves and for their families. Of the 56 men, five were captured by the British and tortured before they were killed. Twelve had their homes looted and burned to the ground. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons that were captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships that they received during the war. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planner and trader, saw his ships sunk by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts, and he died in poverty. At the Battle of Yorktown, the British General Cornwallis took over Thomas Nelson's home for his headquarters. Nelson quietly ordered General George Washington to open fire on his own home, so that the enemy might be destroyed. The home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children all fled for their lives. His fields and mill were destroyed. For over a year, he lived in the forest and in caves, returning home only to find his wife dead. His children vanished his home destroyed. A few weeks later, he himself died from exhaustion. This nation was established at a great price. This past week, we celebrated the freedom we have because of so many who have been willing to serve and even pay the ultimate price, give their life for our freedom. We must not take our freedom as Americans for granted. We must also continually recognize the freedom we have through Jesus Christ, the freedom we have as Christians. And as we think about the freedom we have as Americans, and more importantly, the freedom we have as Christians through Christ, I'd like us to notice four things this morning. And the first is this. All nations are not spiritually equal. All nations are not spiritually equal. We find this from the very very beginning. In the Old Testament, there were God's people, and then there were the Gentiles, the, the worldly people, the lost. What separated God's people from those of the world? Well, God's people sought to live by the will of God. They recognized God's authority in their life. Those in the world did not. They sought their own will. They did not recognize God as an authority. Even when a majority of God's people turned away from God, they were still more spiritual spiritual because they still had those within them who followed God, who obeyed His authority. The world was saved by some of those people, people like Noah, because he submitted to God's authority. And if you look through the Old Testament, you'll notice that the Israelite prospered when they were spiritual and committed to God's authority. They struggled when they would turn away from him. We even find an example in God's word of God saving a worldly city and raining down sulfur and fire on another worldly city. God chose to destroy Sodom 
but he chose to save Nineveh. This was based on each city's reaction to God's authority. Nineveh repented and was saved. Sodom continued in their sin and was destroyed. We see that nations are different today, some more spiritual than others. We have nations like Iraq and Iran where there's great oppression, great struggle. Why? Because the Spirit of God is hardly found there. The majority does not submit to God's authority. We've heard for months now about North Korea. They do not appear to be a spiritual country. They seem to be oppressed. So many seem to struggle. Why? Because the Spirit of God is hardly found there because the majority of the people in that country, in that nation, do not submit to God's authority. All nations are not spiritually equal. And often this is due to the authority within a nation. The Apostle Paul wrote the following to the church at Rome. Romans 13, 1 through 4. There's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, for the ruler is God's servant to do good. Now, he wrote that to the church at Rome. The authorities in Rome were evil, evil men. Uh, they attacked the church, persecuted the church, lived the worldly life to the extreme. And admittedly, that statement, the ruler is God's servant to do us good, seems difficult to accept when we read about the church at Rome and the authorities and their persecution. It's hard today to read that and understand that when we see brothers and sisters in Christ and other countries and nations who are oppressed and persecuted and even killed because they are Christians. But in his infinite wisdom and sovereignty, and for reasons known only to himself, God allows rulers to go contrary to his, his will at times. But the evil actions of those rulers against God's children are never beyond the bounds of God's sovereignty. And we should remember that God works in history from an eternal perspective, whereas we tend to view the outworking of history from a temporal type perspective. Evil authorities have always been a struggle for their nations. They have always been a struggle for the church. And this is why Paul urges that prayers be lifted up for those in authority, even those who do evil. He would write this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Paul says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. You see, we must recognize that all nations are not equal spiritually and pray for their leaders. We should pray for our leaders here in America who are not spiritual as well. Pray for the leaders of Iraq, for the leader of North Korea, for our leaders here in our country, for leaders all over the world. Why? Because Paul tells us that we should do this so that we may live in peace and quiet, have peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Because all nations and all leaders are not equal when it comes to that which is spiritual. Well, we notice next this morning, any nation who honors God is promised God's blessing. It's often easy for us to think of God as an American, isn't it? I mean, we just picture God in his USA shirt, all right? However, God loves everyone. Everyone. God does not recognize the American flag over any other flag. Don't take my word for it. Take his word for it. Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, God sees the world as those who are lost and those who are in Christ. Simply two divisions. Those who are lost, those who are in, who are in Christ. However, the Bible does say this in Psalms 33, 12, and we need to cling to this. The psalmist writes, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Now, God does not favor countries like we favor different athletic teams. His word is clear on this. God blesses countries who submit to his will 
and authority. That's who he shows favor upon. Our forefathers understood this. Abraham Lincoln would say, Such a man the times have demanded, and such in the providence of God was given us. But he is gone. Let us strive to deserve, as far as mortals may, the continued care of divine providence, trusting that in future national emergencies, God will not fail to provide us the instruments of safety and security. George Washington, in his farewell address to the nation, would say, Our laws and our institutions must necessarily be based upon and embody the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. It's impossible that it should be otherwise. And in the, in the sense and to this extent, our civilization and our institutions must be emphatically Christian, he said. You know, even visitors to this country have understood that our nation has been blessed by God. French writer Alexis de Tocqueville, after visiting America in 1831, said the following, I sought for the greatness of the United States in her commodious harbors, her ample rivers, her fertile, fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for it in her rich mines, her vast world commerce, her public school system, and in her institutions of higher learning, and it was not there. I looked for it in her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpit, pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. God has blessed our nation. I think we know that. Which leads us to notice next, the blessed nation should give thanks. The psalmist sings in Psalms 117, 1 and 2, Praise the Lord, all your nations, extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you nations. I've mentioned that internet church is becoming more and more popular. I've shared scriptures where the concept of attending church in your living room in your pajamas is really not scriptural, not what God desires. The psalm, this psalm is another example of the need for us to come together, all nations, all peoples, coming together to give thanks, to praise the Lord. I don't know if you've ever recognized this or read Psalms 117, but it's just these two verses. That's all it is, two verses. Why? Because I believe these words are so important, the writer knew they should stand alone. See, our purpose in life is to praise the Lord. In everything we say and everything we do, praise the Lord. Praise Him as individuals and praise Him as a people and nation. He's worthy of our praise. The psalmist would go on to sing in Psalms 96.3, Declare His nations among the Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. Psalms 47, 1, clap your hands, all you nations, shout to God with cries of joy. You know, as Americans, we should not just set off fireworks on the 4th of July. We should clap our hands and shout cries of joy for the many ways God has blessed us. Isn't it amazing all the fireworks that go off this weekend every year? It just keeps you up at night, doesn't it? And it just booms. And I was telling Stephanie last night, I don't, I don't get it. I get the ones that go up and look pretty, but just the loud booms? I, I just don't get the purpose of that. I don't know about you, but I don't. I, I mean, are you that bored that you just want to hear a big loud boom? You know, but anyway, we do that every year. Boom, celebrate. Buy the fireworks. Stores pop up all over the place. We want to celebrate. We want to make noise. Because we're free as a nation. Well, how much more should we want to make noise every Sunday? Clap our hands and rejoice and give God glory. You know, no nation in the world has been blessed more than the United States. No nation. Anyone who has traveled to other continents is aware that we are uniquely blessed 
with incredible resources, breathtaking scenery, unprecedented freedom, and international influence. We've also been blessed with a system of government that has served us well for over 200 years. Why have we been so blessed? Are we more intelligent? No. More industrious? No. More deserving? No. We are blessed because God was honored in the founding of this country. And he has kept his promise. He's kept his promise. The fact that this country was founded with Christian principles is so evident in early documents and inscriptions on historic buildings and monuments that that fact cannot be denied. This country was established as one nation under God. We've been blessed. God's kept his promise, and therefore we should give thanks. Thanks to God. Thanks to Jesus. Thanks for his Holy Spirit. Thanks for his word. With thankfulness to God in our heart, I want to extend another love challenge this morning. It's a patriot love challenge. Perhaps you saw down in the entryway uh, a Christmas tree uh, with lights and, and, and patriotic ornaments on it. Each ornament bears the name of someone who's in the military on our prayer list. These are family members of, of those who attend. Each name has two heart ornaments on the tree. There are seven people in the military uh, on our prayer list at this time. Um, So there will be 14 ornaments on the tree, two for each person that's on our prayer list. So I would like to encourage you to adopt a serviceman or woman for the next 12 months, from this July 4th to the next July 4th. And we would like for you to pray for them every day, send them a note of encouragement at least once a month. Send them care packages. Let your young children or grandchildren make things for them and send them to them to encourage them. Send them gifts on their birthday, on holidays. So the challenge is to grab an ornament. Please just take one so that several people, families will get to do this. Um, You will notice on the back the name of the service man or woman And then you can go to the table and get an envelope, and that will give you their address and their likes and birthday and other information about them. Now, I want to tell you, don't take one if you're not going to get into it, all right? Because I think we've got at least 14 families or individuals here that will get into it. But let's show them our thankfulness. Let's let them know of, of God's encouragement. Let's show them the kindness of Jesus as a way of thanking God for them and thanking them for their service. So I encourage you to do that after after worship this morning. But don't miss the point. God blesses individuals, even nations, who submit to him. Which leads us to notice next. God will remove the hand of blessing from the nation that forsakes him. We need to know that. Psalms 33.10 The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the people. Psalms 9, 17, The wicked go down to the realm of the dead, all the nations that forget God. We can't forget God. We need to remain one nation under God. We are blessed as a nation. However, I'm starting to worry that someday we might lose that blessing. I read this week that the United States is now number one in the world in violent crime, divorce, teen pregnancy, abortions, and illegal drugs. Number one. Those things go against the authority of God. Taylor Swift, one of the most popular music artists in the world, has a new song out titled, You Need to Calm Down. Listen to a portion of the lyrics. You are somebody that we don't know. But you're coming at my friends like a missile. Why are you mad when you could be glad? And glad in her lyrics is spelled G-L-A-A-D, which stands for Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. You could be glad. Sunshine on the street at the parade, but you would rather be in the dark ages. Just making that sign must have taken all night. You just need to take several seats and then try to restore the peace and control your urges to scream about all the people you hate because shade never made anybody less gay. So, oh, 
you, you need to calm down. You're, you're being too loud. And I'm just like, oh, you need to just stop. Like you can just not step on his gown. You need to calm down. That's what our young people are singing today, dancing to today, listening to. And my response to that song is, first of all, we, we do not hate. We do not hate. The world needs to understand that Christians do not hate gay people or any people. But we also need to realize and do not be deceived. She does not want us to calm down. She wants us to accept a sinful lifestyle. We know from Scripture it's a lifestyle that is detestable to God. It goes against creation. And God will not bless a nation who calms down and accepts immoral lifestyles. Now again, we must love them, encourage them, get up next to them, and try to move them towards God, help them leave their life of sin. But acceptance, not an option. Bill Russell writes, saluting the flag, standing at attention during the national anthem, singing God bless America, and voting faithfully are not the most patriotic things you can do for this country. We help America most, he says, by living a godly life. That's how we can help this nation the most, by living a godly life. <laughs> Psalms 33, 5. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. Psalms 33, 16 through 22. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, they cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. You see, it's not time to calm down. It's not time to be quiet. It's not time to accept the world. For many, it's simply time to repent. Repent. I believe as a nation, we need to follow the writings of Peter who declared in Acts 3.19, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. We must heed the words of God shared by his prophet in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then, will, I hear, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Our country was built on its submission to being one nation under God. We need to remember that, recognize that, know that. I like to finish with a story about prayer and then with an actual prayer that was given a few years back. During the dark days of, American, of the American Revolution, when the Continental Army had experienced several setbacks, a farmer who lived near the battlefield approached Washington's camp unheard. Suddenly his ears caught an earnest voice raised in agonizing prayer. On coming near, he saw it was the great general, down on his knees, in the snow, his cheeks wet with tears, and he was asking for God's assistance and guidance. The farmer crept away and returned home, and he said to his family, it's going to be all right. We're going to win. What makes you think so, his wife asked. Well, said the farmer, I heard General Washington pray out in the woods today. Such fervent prayer I've never heard. And God will surely hear and answer that kind of prayer. I believe that's what we need to do as God's people. We need to pray to the point of tears, fervently pray for this nation, for all nations, for the world to come to Jesus Christ. Joe Wright, the minister of the Central Christian Church, prayed the following prayer several years ago to open a session of the Kansas State Senate. He prayed, Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, Woe to those who call evil good. 
But that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and inverted our own values. We confess that we have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word in the name of moral pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it an alternative lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and called it a lottery. We've neglected the needy and called it self-preservation. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. In the name of choice, we have killed our unborn. In the name of the right to life, we have killed abortionists. We've neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We've coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it taxes. We've polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We've ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O God, and know our hearts today. Try us and show us any wickedness within us. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Guide and bless these men and women who have been sent here by the people of Kansas and who have been ordained by you to govern this great state. Grant them your wisdom to rule and may their decisions direct us to the center of your will. I ask it in the name of your Son, the living Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May our nation continue to be one nation under God. May we as individuals and as a nation give thanks to God, and if so, may we repent if we need to. Repent on our knees before God so that our children and our children's children and their children shall be blessed by their Creator. As the worship leaders come this morning, if you have a decision to make to get right with God, to repent so that He can bring His blessing upon you, I just want to encourage you to make it today to come forward as we stand and sing. Let's stand and sing together.